if I was, if I, if I was I'm going to use modern parlance, I would say that Korach is the is the modern or that the early European Zionist who said that the way of the old country was great for the old country. It has no place in the new world. We have to shed that image of that type of Jew because we don't because the model of that was great for where it was for the shtetl for the yeshiva world, right? For the Torah world that exists, but in Israel or in America, we need we need a different model. We need a different model, and in that model, we don't need a Moses. We don't need rabbis. We need pioneers. We need we need a different type of Jew. To, who can teach us how to integrate Jewish values in a much more modern context, in a context that speaks to the language of the culture where we are in, right? This is how I would translate. In other words, it's like is it's like trying to schlep the Yiddish and the rabbis of Europe into America. That was the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. It's a new country, it's a new land, right? Not that we shouldn't be Jewish anymore, although. We do know that for most people, that challenge was too great, and they did throw their Judaism overboard, right? Countless Jews threw their tefillin and their talises over the over the ship when they came to America because they said Judaism was great in that country. This, this, we need a different kind of Judaism, and the different denominations of Judaism that had faced that challenge. They said, "Listen, what's going to win is we live in a culture, and we're going to figure out just how much Judaism we're going to integrate into this culture." Whereas the Moshe model is the Torah is at the center. God gave us the Torah. There's nothing in this world that contradicts or that overwhelms Torah. Our challenge is, no matter where we live in the world, in what society, in what age, in what era, is how are we going to take these timeless values and live proudly, not shun the world around us, not be intimidated by it, but figure out how are we going to integrate these values in the society that we are living in today. That is, that is, it, when you, if you look at the story in that context, it's mind blowing that two thousand, three and three and a half thousand years later, we're still having that same argument. That argument happened again and again and again over the centuries. But what, what, is, what is the ultimate value of a Jew? Until today, there are hundreds of thousands of Jews, Jews will tell you, it's to study Talmud and to study more Talmud I study more Talmud, and the, 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 someone will send, send you a stipend in the form of manda that will fall every single morning or every Friday. So you'll get a check in the mail by somebody who's supporting you to study Torah. That's, they're living that life. And their Rosh Yeshiva, their teachers, their rabbis are their Moses, and that's their world. And everything that's happening outside in the world is a distraction at best. It is evil and temptation at the worst. And so the only way to keep it out is to build the wall, and everything, else, everything outside the wall is true, so to speak, right? The, the opposite value is, is, is not necessarily better. It's the idea is that, is that we're going to filter, according to our minds, how much Torah, how much Judaism makes sense or fits in the condition of the world that we're living in, the society that we're living in. But true, true Judaism doesn't ask you to make that kind of equation or sacrifice. It just it, it requires you to be very, very strong in commitment, but to be broad-minded and open enough to recognize that God really wants us to do, we spoke about less, some level of, of you have to be a shepherd. Both values have a conversation. Let's shun, let's shun Jewish, we don't need leaders, we don't need rabbis, we need Chalutzin, we need, we need, a diff, we need a new Jew, a different kind of a Jew. This is that's the conflict. They both lose. That's that's what's the lesson of the Torah. The Torah says both of them in, in extreme don't work. You have to you have to find God wants us to marry these two divergent views. God wants us to take the a yeshiva mentality and put it on the street of Tel Aviv and says. Marry the two. They, act, they don't contradict each other. Figure it out. That's, that is the goal that God wants us. God wants us to go into Israel with Moses, without Moses. The Torah is going to be your guide. But use that guide to create a holy society, 
even if that society is rejecting the, the, the medication that you're bringing. That's, that's, that's the result of these parshas. Very few times in history have, have people been able to bring these two worlds together. It's hard, right? Like I said, it's been tried. It's, it's, not, that, it's not that previous generations didn't know. But you, you people, human beings are human beings, and that's why those generations failed too. Because the, the generation of the spies, it's not that they didn't know. They said, we're not capable, we can't, it's, it's, it's too difficult. We're not made for that. You know what we're made for? We're made for studying Torah. That's what we're good for. You want, you want soldiers? You, you need an IDF? That, our children, our grandchildren. That, that, we're, we're too old to change our stripes, right? And so God said, great, you stay in the desert, you'll die in the desert, no problem. Your grandchildren, they're, they're going to go into Israel, they're going to be the first IDF, right? The flip side is, though, what happens when the Jews come into Israel? They very, very quickly careen off their spiritual path. And God has to send them one south savior or another savior. As I told you, study the book of Joshua and the book of Judges and the book of Samuel and the book of Kings. It's a, it's a roller coaster of people trying to preserve the teaching of Moses with the new life in the land of Israel. And so they go, they, they go way to the left and they start following. What's the story? Moshe warns them at the end of Deuteronomy. He goes, I know it's going to, Moshe says, I know it's going to happen. But Moshe's a servant of God. He's, this is what God wants you to do. But Moshe says, if you don't study the Torah, and you're not, you're not strong on the Torah, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go off the path, and you're going to follow the, the, the pagan cultures that you're going to, because you're going to, you're going to say, because you're going to want to be just like them. And that's exactly what happened. The Jewish people want to be like the Philistines. They want to be like the Canaanites and the Jebusites, right? And so, for hundreds of years, it was a tug of war. So the prophet Samuel and King David come along and establish, establish a, a Jewish model, a Jewish spiritual Torah-based model in Israel that becomes a powerful fusion of the two that lasts for two commonwealth. For a thousand years, it lasted. But why do we look at that as the epitome because what King David and King Solomon and what what and what, what, they, what, what were they doing? They figured they understood that, that you can't have one without the other. There has to be a fusion of the two. You have to you have to have a society. You have to have an army. You have to have an economy. You have to have a, you have to have complicated life governed by the Torah. And it lasted for two thousand years. But for the time before that, and for the two thousand years since. As Jews, we haven't figured out exactly. Now, for much, we didn't have the possibility. We, we didn't have sovereignty. We didn't have the political will. We didn't have the, the political ability to, to fuse those two. We were living as minorities in other countries. And so to preserve our Jewish identity, maybe, maybe we had no choice but to live in ghettos and but to preserve our, our spiritual core because the opposite wasn't even possible, the flip side. But today we have that, today, today, or since 1948, we're steering back at maybe what we were looking at 3,000 years ago, and that is, are we going to choose a secular type of life with a sprinkling of Jewish ideas, or are we going to choose a Jewish isolationism and, and reject everything that's not, or are we going to figure out that God still wants us to, God wants us to learn how to marry the two and say that they, they are not mutually exclusive. It's not mutually exclusive to be a practicing, believing, living, studious Jew and also be a functioning member of society that contributes society and, and, high, and use those values to perfect and change the world that you live in to reflect those values and not abandon it. That's that is, is a, that is the, certainly the, the mouth that we need to climb. I say this because, why, I, I heard, I heard the Rebbe talking about this so many times. Because for him, that, that, that was his challenge in the post-Holocaust Judaism. That, that he, he felt like he had to schlep, on one hand, those who felt that we have to preserve Jewish learning, 
and those who felt like Jewish learning does not have, or the old world does not have a place in the new world. And he was obsessed with the idea that you don't have to abandon one for the other. They can, they can both, they can coexist side by side. And as a matter of fact, he felt that, that they will actually support each other if you believe 100% in Torah, and you believe 100% in God's world, that God created a world that's not a jungle. It look, may look like it, but if God created a world, if God created it, it emanates from God, then we have no choice but to take God's blueprint and use it in the world that God created. So this is, a, um, this is an, an analysis of looking, once, once we recognize, perhaps, he's saying, what the true motivation of Korach was, that it wasn't just a rebellion to overthrow one movement, because historically, all revolutions, all kultas, are, are, no matter how noble they are, it just replaces one, one tyranny for an even greater tyranny. Right? The, the, the people who overthrow are themselves looking to become in charge afterwards. So we can look at Korach's stories as simply as a story of jealousy, of siblings, je of cousins who are jealous of each other, and, um, and that people did not like that, that Moshe made Aaron his brother, his right hand, his, his, you know, the high priest, and Miriam, and they, they felt that. But uh, that's obviously not what happened, because and any, any deeper reading of the Torah on an even more superficial level shows you that Moshe didn't want the job. It's like, if, if, if Moshe was... If, if Moshe ran a campaign, if Moshe was, if, if Moshe was you know, a, a modern politician of today, that we know that all they want is to get elected, and when they get elected, all they're thinking about is getting re-elected, and that power is what they're after, then we can look at the story in, in a different way. But portion after portion, the, the, whole, the, the, the essence of Moshe's angst is that it's being thrust on him. The whole story of Moshe is he didn't want it. He didn't want it in the beginning at the burning bush. He cries to God in the last week's Torah, which is, get, find somebody else. For, you, you want, I want it? It's the, where, where each other leader in the history of leadership is running away. He's the greatest leader of his time, and he never feels comfortable with it. It's not, it's not, it's not even that he's trying to, that he's trying to you know, preserve the, uh, the status quo. He, he's, he's incessantly trying to get other people to take his job, he wants to get away from it. He feels unworthy. He feels like he, he feels like he's um, he's 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 a babysitter for a bunch of malcontents, and oh, no, oh, and, and, he, and he complains to God, God again. What do I need this for? What, I I, I want to have a private life. I, I want my own quiet life. I don't want it. So, so Moshe, Moshe had no pride here. Moshe Moshe wasn't Moshe wasn't defending his office. He didn't want it. God forced him into it. He not, and God kept forcing him to keep keep moving and moving and moving. And Moshe, Moshe was literally a servant. He always saw himself as a public servant. There's a beautiful uh, teaching in the, in the Talmud of Hariyot. Talmud describes how that there were that there were two rabbis who were very humble. Rabbi Rabbi Yosef and Talmud that he must roll that him and say that um, Rabbi Gamliel calls them in to his office. This is in the time of the second temple and he wanted them he wanted them to take a position to be rabbis in a certain town and they didn't want to come because they knew that uh, he was going to ask them but they wanted to sit and study they wanted to be anonymous they were humble people and they were looking they weren't looking for honor see the demands they come in he says you think i'm giving you a position of leadership i'm making you into servants you guys go do what i'm telling you to do because because what I'm, I'm, I'm putting you into, I'm putting you into hard labor. That's what I'm giving you. From the very beginning, every leader of the Jewish people, every spiritual leader of the Jewish people, never saw themselves as having any power whatsoever. And even political power, the Torah puts so much limits on political power of kings, of Jewish kings, only to teach them that the power shouldn't get to them. Do you know that a king, a Jewish king, had to have a special Torah scroll made, written specially for him? And he had to hold it and carry it and hold it in his lap a whole, all time, all the time. He had to always carry a Torah. You know why? You know, like, can you imagine you're a king and you always have to carry the Torah where you go? He, it, says when he, it says when he was sitting, the, 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 the Torah the Deuteronomy says, if you, if you sit, remember where your power, where it comes from. God gave you the job 
to shepherd people, to look after his flock. And remember the Torah, you're governed by the same Torah like everybody else. The Jewish king, the Jewish rabbi, the Jewish... There's no, there are no separate laws for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the next class. As a matter of fact, they have even greater restrictions. The Torah, the Torah puts on them, why? Because they have to be constantly reminded that don't let, don't let your position get to you, to your mind. It's not about you. You were given it in order to facilitate, help other people find their way. And so the, so the king always had to have a Torah scroll to remind him that, that God stands above him and that he has to be, if he, he has to be always literally physically connected to the Torah to always remember that his, the power comes from Torah, not from him. So this is, if, so knowing who Moshe, Moses was and that it was never that he didn't want the job he was always trying to run away from the job. And he, in two portions ago in Baha'u'llah, we read about how Eldad and Medad are prophesizing and, and, and the t- Rashi writes that it was Yeshua's son who comes crying to Moshe is that there are people prophesizing about you, that, they, that you're going to die and you're not going to go into Israel. Put a stop to that. You know what Moshe says? I'm so happy. You think, I think I want to be the only prophet. I wish God would make everybody prophets. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe somebody else would be a better prophet. I can go, I can retire. Moshe doesn't want the job. He doesn't want to be the prophet anymore. When you look at it in that light, you recognize that these, both of these stories, understanding from the light that Korach wasn't a simple rebel. Korach, the spies were not, were not just scared uh, malcontents, that they, that they had a vision of staying with Moshe and studying Torah. Korach's vision was that, it, that, that, that God is forcing us into Israel. That, that, and then the, that the, the spy's sin, the spy's eternal sin was that God does not want us to stay in the desert with Moshe and study Torah. God wants us to channel that and go into Israel and, be, and become sophisticated Torah citizens. So Korach says, hey, let's, that means we, have, we need to change the equation of what it means to be a Jew. We don't need to take that, we can't take that model with us into Israel. It's not going to work. Both of those stories, then the, both of those stories tell us that the answer is the answer is it's a combination. The, the answer is it's both. Judaism is always it's never all of one or the other. As Maimonides says, there's a golden path, there's a golden middle path that that, that harnesses both sides, the, the the deep and real Torah study and learning. But as we say in this before the Shema, there's a there's a powerful prayer that I would encourage you to study, but really to meditate. It's called Ahavat. It's in the Brachot of Krishma. And there are two. It's Ahavat Olam or Ahavat Rabbah. It depends whether you, you read the Nusach Spar or Nusach Ashkenaz, the, the German Nusach or the uh, Sephardi Nusach. It, it says, right before the Shema, it says, Avinu Avarachman, right? Lishmoa lilmod ulalameh, lishmor velasot ulakayim at Bodhi Beit Hamotor Techo Be'alba. Right? Before we say the Shema, before we, we close our eyes and we, and we acknowledge God's unity and God's mastery of the world, we recognize that there's two parts. Milmod, Ulam, to study and to teach, but it cannot be for nobody. And what good is it if a bunch of people call themselves Jews, but they don't know what the Torah says, right? We need, we need, we need to bring a, a shift a, a, that where Jews know what the Torah says, but they know what the Torah says because of what Torah wants them, how Torah wants them to live. When that when that works, when that works, that is that is the fulfillment of God's purpose of creation. Whatever we, we don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but we know that that's God's ultimate will when He created the world. Is that God wanted that human beings, flawed human beings, should take a perfect Torah into an imperfect, flawed world, and with and with flawed personalities, figure out how we're going to implement Torah's vision for perfecting the world. It's an ongoing process. It's not right? It's an ongoing process. And until the end of time comes, we don't know how it's going to play out. But that's that is what emerges from these two stories, where each one has a powerful impulse to take to go one way or the other, to go all the way into the ghetto in the clouds, so to speak. And the other one wants, wants to go all the way into Created in, in a society without Judaic, without Judaic uh, overlords, and we see that God rejects them both. God rejects them both. God wants, God wants us both. 
And sometimes we feel like it's an impossible situation. We were, we were talking about, we were studying about the other, the other week as well. The paradox of being a Jew means that, that to, to, to know that God knows what's going to happen and to have faith that we still have choice and that God doesn't compel us to act in a certain way. And the paradox to know that, that there are things that happen in the world that we can understand, but that we know that God wants us to, to go forward anyway even if we don't understand it. And, um, and to, live, to, live with, to live with a question at the mark at the end can be difficult, but it, it's, it seems that, that that's what Judaism has, uh, in, in the, in, at least in the last couple of thousand years, that God wants us to live with, in, in, in a world of, God wants us to understand this struggle and live that struggle and recognize that there's a tension. There's always going to be attention, and that's okay. We don't have to have resolution. There are many times in the Talmud, the Talmud deals with questions all the time. And the Talmud, uh, when the Talmud has a question that it doesn't have an answer to, the Talmud ends teku. You know what the word teku means? If you, when you study Talmud, so many times you study Talmud, the Talmud goes back and forth, question, answer. But then there are t- questions that are so new that there are many times the Talmud has a question, and, nobody, and even the rabbis don't have an answer for it. But the Talmud answers teku. So the word teku means let the question stand. It's Aramaic means teku. The question remains standing. It's a great question. Let every question have an answer. It's a question. We're going to. There is a uh, comment here. Tied, it's also tied game in sports. Teku? Oh, well, teku? Like tied game? Oh, right. No, no resolution. Teku, yeah. So <laughs> you know, it's, see, you've been studying Talmud your whole life before you. Right. Teku, it's, it's Aramaic. The word, so teku, teku means let it stand. The commentaries point out that the Teku isn't actually an acronym. Teku has four letters. Tough, Yud, Kuf, Vav. Teku stands for a pseudonym for Elijah the Prophet because he's called Eliyahu Anavi, Eliyahu Hatishbi. On Saturday night after Havdalah, we sing Eliyahu Anavi, Eliyahu Hatishbi because Elijah the Prophet came from Tishbi. That was, that's where he came from. He was, he, he, he was a Tishbi. So the, the comment says Tishbi, the way of tradition that when Messiah, when Messiah comes, we're going to have so many questions. Halavai, our question should be about the Talmud, that we don't know. People are going to cry out what took so long, where we for the past 2,000 years, where, where were we during the Holocaust. People are going to have lots of questions that we don't have answers to, right? But Elijah's going to come, and to the Talmud says, Tishbi Yitzharit, he will answer Kushod Vabayot, he will answer all our unresolved questions. And when he comes to answer all those questions, he'll answer those questions too. It's okay. We, we don't need an answer tonight, right? Yeah. Can I ask another question? Sure. I don't have an answer, but we'll try. Okay, um, I'm just wondering if uh, the um, ending, Korah's ending, being swallowed up by New York, isn't some evidence of... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just, my, my advocate stopped for someone else. Isn't evidence that that's not a very favorable position in the Torah? One more time, sorry about that. Well, Korach was swallowed. Korach is not, he's not seen favorably? I, I, yeah, that's, if somebody, somebody rebels against authority and then is swallowed up by the earth, it doesn't sound like the Torah makes that seem like a very reasonable position, a very favorable position. And, and the position of last week where they all die in the desert for four, after 40 years, that doesn't seem like, that doesn't seem, right? Well, that's a little bit milder, I think, dying after 40 years of being swallowed up. Um, I'll tell you, there's an opinion in the Talmud that the generation of, that, in, in some ways, no. There's an opinion in the Talmud that the generation that died in the desert has no share in the world to come. The people who worship the golden calf, the people who, with Korach, they get a share in the world to come. But the generation of the spies, they don't get. Because one was a spiritual rebellion against God, against God's plan. You can't. You, you have to go. There's always another layer to it. I want you to know that Korach's children, the Korach's children were survived. When you read the story in this week's Torah portion, it says that Korach and his entire family were they, they were swallowed by the earth, right? So Rashi tells the story, but if you um, if you open up a book of Psalms, there, there are there are 150 Psalms. The Psalms were, were written by uh, King David is a composer, is considered the composer of the Book of Psalms, right? But King David actually was composed with 
ten, ten uh, contributors to the book of Psalms. Moses, Adam, Asaf. There are a number of Psalms that are written by the Korah, by the children of Korah. Look at the, the number, 70. So you'll see, if, 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 if you take it down, I'll show you Psalms that were written by the children of Korah. How did, what happened? Talmud says is that when, when this was going on, the children of Korah re regretted deeply what was going on. They knew that their father was off his rocket. But out of respect to their father, they went along with him. But inside, they did not go along with it, and they kept their mouth shut. So they stood with, with their father in his, in his rebellion. They did Teshuvah they, they, inwardly. So the Talmud says what happened was that God created a secondary shelf under the crust of the earth where they sat for 38 years. After 30, everybody thought they, did, they died. Think of everybody else in rebellion. 38 years later, the earth opened up and they came back out and they joined and they went into Israel. And they wrote, and the Psalms that they wrote during that time underground made it into King David's Psalms, right? And that, so in other words, Korach's family lives on. The implication is that there's something about there was, there was a value to Korach. The rebellion was ill-fated. The idea behind it had some value to it, but as in life, right, the way we go about things can damage very... We can have very, very noble ideas. It's the implementation that's the devil many times, right? Sometimes you can say something, you know, my, my daughter Basi gave her speech the other week, uh, her graduation speech, but the story of the spies. The spies came back and told Moshe exactly what he wanted, what he asked them to do. What, what did they do wrong? Moshe said, spy the land, come back and tell me what's going on. They came back and they told him exactly what he said, what he wanted to do. But they didn't lie, they told the truth. It's how they said it. It was their tone and the, the fear that they ran. Sometimes you, you say, you, you, can, you, you can say it, but the tone that you say changes the meaning, right? I tell you the joke about the um, guy comes to a rabbi one day and he says, Rabbi, I need your help. He says, this guy is, this guy is walking, walking around synagogue every single day, and he's saying that I owe him $100. I don't owe him $100. So he goes, okay, call another, call the other guy. He goes, why are you saying that? Why, why, why are you announcing to everybody that the guy owes you $100? He owes me $100. He says, he denies it. He's a liar. He says, do you have any proof? Do you have any witnesses? So he says, no. So if that's the case, if you have no witnesses, you have no proof, you can't force someone to the, the halakha is Hamotz Mechaver Olav Araya, Talmud says, you have to, if you, if you want to bring money to somebody else, you have to have proof. You have no proof. And you can't go around saying that you, he owes you money if you have no proof. So the other guy says, but Rabbi, it's too late already. He went around bad mouthing me to the whole community, and now nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants to do business with me. They think I'm a liar and a cheater because he spread this false rumor about me. So the rabbi says, okay, next Shabbos, he tells this guy, Barry, you're going to get up on the bima, and you're going to say what I've been telling this whole past week about Reuben, that he's a thief, it's a lie. That's, you have to make amends. You have, to, you have to clear his name. So two weeks later, the guy comes back to the rabbi. Oh, it's even worse. It's even worse. What happened now? He called the guy. And he goes, rabbi, I did exactly what you told me to do. I went, on, I went up on the bima. You told me to say what I said about my friend Reuben, that he's a thief, is a lie. So he's, Rabbi says, tell me exactly what you said. He says, well, I said, what I said about my friend Reuben is a thief. Is a lie? <laughs> right? You say, they said, you, could, you could say word for word, right? It, it's your tone, right? Changes everything. And so how, how we say things can make something positive very, very negative very quickly. So the the, the, the so the, 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 a big, many of the commentaries write that a big aspect of what happened with the spies wasn't what they said, it was how they said it. Right? They came back, they told Moshe, yes, it's a, it's a beautiful land, but there are strong people there. But then they went on to emphasize and scare the people the way, the way they, they, um, they ratcheted up the fear with the people in a way that all the good they were going to say was immediately washed out by, by the rhetoric of the fear. It happens all the time. So you, 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 give, you give a compliment to somebody, and then you it, you overshadow it with something else, and then the compliment is lost. Well, I, I said a nice thing about him. Yeah, but you drown it in a bunch of other stuff, right? What good is it now? So, 
Anyway, this, 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 so the reason why I'm, I'm telling you about the story of the sons of Korach is because there's many stories of the Torah, and I, and I'm going to, I don't have to break up. Many stories of the Torah, you can't, you don't always know from the from the literal story what their end result really is. Like for example, the, the sons of Korach, um, we don't know the story until the end, until, until, until a number of portions later. The, the, the Torah conceals it. Um, because the, the, Torah, the, Torah, the Torah does not want you to know that reality at that point, for, for there, are, there are reasons for that. But the end result is that sometimes a story that seems to you to be much more wor- to, to be worse the punishment, it can be a worse physical punishment, but they get to have a, they, but they have a, spiritually they get a reward. People, um, I'll give you an example. In the story of in, the, in, in Genesis, we read two stories: the story of the flood of Noah, right, and the story of the Tower of Babel. The worst story that God destroyed the whole world and flooded and killed them all, or the story of the Tower of Babel that God dispersed them and gave them new languages. You would think the story of Noah. But t- so the Talmud says that the generation of Noah's flood, they all have a share in the world to come. Why? Because their sin, right? Their sin was that a, their sin was a crime, right? The, the sin of the Tower of Babel was a rebellion against God. They wanted to build a tower and go to war with God, whatever they whatever they were thinking, right? So, what does God do? God says, "If you want to fight me, fine. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a jealous kind of person. As, 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 that may have a less of a spiritual effect, but has a much more of a physical effect. So sometimes, when you look at a punishment, you don't always know what the, what the end result is just by saying, "Oh, that this person got a worse physical punishment." Yeah, but it's very possible that their souls were 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 uh, purified because of it, whereas the other ones did not. Um, it, it's 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 for a different class and different conversation. It's a good question. I, I do need to give it more time, and I, I unfortunately do not have the time to go into it now. I do want to point out to you just very briefly here. Where is it? Turn to page 879. Right, verse, it's chapter 26, verse 11. You see how the Torah, it's four words. The Torah just throws it in there randomly. You see where it says that? Uvnei Korach lo metu. The sons of Korach did not die. Boom. There Korach... So there's a long Rashi. I'm not going to do the whole Rashi, but I'm sure the, the note me- mentioned has to. They better mention it because I, I would imagine it would mention. It should be mentioned. Mention. Yeah. They don't even mention it, huh? Because it's it's very very it's it's a very theologically complex idea. I want to see if they say anything about it in the note, but they don't. Oh, the, here's the Rashi. You know what Rashi writes? Rashi writes, "Heim hayu They in the beginning they were they were part of the original rebellion from the beginning. They were from the front. From the forerunners, not that they were just they were from the organizers. But the time during that they, they at the time when it all went down, they did shuva in their hearts. A special place in hell was set aside for them. The Yashvusham and they sat in hell. They used the euphemism they sat in hell alive, but literally under the crust of the earth for 38 years. So the question is, why does the Torah tell? Why, why does the Torah tell? Because if, if they would have been saved then, right? Okay, you know, it's, it's a whole different situation. But the, the, anyway, the point I'll, I'll talk about it a different way. The I'll have to get you to come back another moment. Uh, but 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 sometimes here you don't know the story. But you have to go portions later, and it's a, it's, a th- it's almost like a throwaway line later on that has no chance. And you see how the Torah ties stories together, but you don't always you don't always know the end of the story. It could be a story you're reading. You, you're, but you, you gotta wait till the end of the movie before you can pass judgment. Huh? Cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger. You gotta wait until the end of the. You gotta wait for the credits. Don't don't uh, <laughs> don't 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 slam your popcorn down right in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Um, is observing um, um, the laws regarding rituals more important, or the laws regarding ethics? I can't. I, I don't know. There's something that is more important. It's, it's, 
God doesn't tell us in the Torah that there are more to shun that are more important than others. Is that equally important? I would say so. I would say so. Where, where, where in the Torah do we ever find this notion that there are some things that are more important than others? Well, if there are examples of people who are not observing the rituals, but are, but are they're observing the ethics, the ethical laws, as opposed to those who... I, I hear what you're saying. The way I would answer it is, the way I would answer it is, is that there's a, there's a in the beginning of chapter two in in, in Pirkei Avos and Ethics of Fathers. I would I'd study that. Read, read it first, Mishnah. And there he writes that we that one should not evaluate one over the other because we do not know the reward and the punishment. We don't we don't know the end result of what is an important one or what's not an important one. We don't know. Here's what we do know though. We know if our determination, our judgment on something is uh, what has a greater consequence, then as a human being we may think oh this one's more important because. For some things, if I do it, I get this reward, right? So if I told you if you did this, you're gonna get you're gonna get ten dollars, and if you do this, you're gonna get a hundred dollars. Then right away in our minds, oh, the hundred dollar mitzvah is much more important, right? I'm still giving you an example. So if the Torah tells us that there's a greater reward for this or a greater punishment for this, then naturally we would assume that one has more. But it doesn't really work that way because we don't know because I because we don't know how, we don't know how to balance physical versus spiritual reward number one. What I would say, though, is there is a difference in that ethical mitzvah between man and fellow man. It seems have have a greater import at, in, in today's time. And the reason for that is because Yom Kippur, we know, traditionally, does not forgive for sins that are, that are of the ethical nature until that person forgives. Anything that's, anything that's ritual-based, that's between you and God, the Talmud tells us that Yom Kippur forgives. We have Yom Kippur once a year. And God forgives, but things that are ethical, that you wrong somebody, or you 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 deceive somebody, or you hurt somebody, Yom Kippur doesn't help for that. Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the only thing that helps for that is for you to go make amends for that person. God does not intervene. So it would seem in that, on that level, yes, ethical mitzvahs stand above that. But that's in terms of consequence. Do we really know how God views it? I don't know. I, I don't think any human being can answer that question. I, it seems that the same the same God that commands both values both of them and says they're both. And I would say maybe you cannot have one without the other. You can, I don't think you can be a true Jew without being ethical. And I don't, and I don't believe that true, true ethics exists without having the values of being God. Because I think all ethics that are relative-based and or more morality-based that are not based upon an absolute system of Torah, I believe... Are not are not strong to don't last, and so I don't think you can have one without the other. But if you're asking in terms of what 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 God tells us bothers him more, it would seem ethics law well, certainly because if it bothers God more when human beings get hurt than when God's honor gets hurt, but and that's that that we can see as a result of how God creates a system of forgiveness. But that's also as a as a product of God says. I can't forgive you for what you've done to somebody else. I can forgive you either what you've done or not done to me, but I'm not going to forgive what you've done to somebody else. So in that sense, it certainly behooves us to be more careful of that because there, because there's no Yom Kippur that can help with that. But um, I don't know that um, on a spirit level whether one whether one can truly say one has greater benefit to one soul than the other. I think that's a dangerous uh, theological idea that we can, we can discern and from God what matters more to God. Uh, that, that's a uh, that's a uh, that's a Korach <laughs> argument. That is that if that God wants this, that means He's reneging of it. No, God wants both. God wants us to find a balance, and to, God wants us to understand that you can't have you can't be a true Jew without being a credit to society, and you can't be a real credit to society. If you're not proud of who you have your identity, if you're if you're a shameful Jew, then you're not then then you're not you, you can't be a, a real citizen. That's they go they go hand in hand. All right, gentlemen, ladies, thank you. It was a pleasure.